Hey, listen, we're about to have a really good, cool guest. Stay tuned. Watch all the way to the end. Got some news about uh, free giveaways. Uh, so you got to watch the end to hear what you got to do to make sure that we can start giving this stuff away. Going to have a lot of cool comics and some other stuff going to be given away on the show. So stay tuned. Hey, welcome to episode eight. Sorry we took a week off. Tales from the Flipside family. Got a special guest tonight. We've been talking about it, kind of innuendoing about it. Like we didn't want to say exactly who it is, uh, but it is Dennis from Wonder World Comics out of, is it Detroit? It, actually in Detroit, Michigan? We started in one of the suburbs of Detroit, but we just moved uh, 30 miles south of Detroit, 30 miles north of Toledo. Okay, oh, well, nice spot. So why don't we start yeah. out, let me uh, find out how you got into the comics. How you got to, you know, where where did comics start for you? Well, I'll tell you what, it was, it, it was all my mother and I came home from school somewhere around the second grade and there was a note on the kitchen table that said, go across the street to the grocery store and buy some comic books. And there was just some loose change on the, on the piece of paper. And I went across the street and I always forget what issue it is, but somebody always remembers. Uh, I believe it's either Batman or Detective 271. And it was Batman and Robin in the background and the Riddler is standing on a case in a warehouse. Uh, and he's, you know, saying something to Batman and Robin. And that, for some reason, that comic just grabbed me. And I, I still can see it in my head. And I had no idea what, I mean, I'm in second grade. I barely know what money is at this point. Right. Let alone that this handful of change can buy me a comic book. And it, it really was, it was inconsequential. I remember that first comic, but it was inconsequential until... Several years later, I, I mostly bought magazines. I bought the Buck Rogers TV show magazine. Um, I, you know, occasionally buy a comic book, but it wasn't until GI Joe number 18, when they ran that commercial series. I don't know if you remember, but they ran a full uh, animated commercial of GI Joe number 18. And I was like, wow, I love GI Joe. I need to get that comic book. You mean when they actually marketed comics? They actually use marketing comic books to help, uh, you know, their their subscriberships and their and their viewerships. Yeah. Uh, so I remember going to uh, another drugstore in a little town called Mawequa, Illinois, population I think eighteen hundred. Um, and then it just kind of I know it blossomed from there because then I went to my grandma's and I took my comic books to my grandmother's house and she gave me the big the obligatory big stack of. Richie Riches and Archies that every grandparent has ever hoarded. And I'm like, I, I'm, I'm a little out of this one, but the barber shop up the road from grandma's house did a two for one trade in on all comic books. And what? I took that stack and I got my first John Byrne, Chris Claremont X-Men. I got early uh, Iron Man's. I got, uh, just a, a plethora, a lot of Captain America and Falcons. And so at that point, I'm like, yeah, give me more. Uh, I got any aunts and uncles that got these uh, old crappy comic books. I'll, uh, I'll I'll take those up to that. And I became a regular at that, uh, at that barber shop, trading in all of the old funny books for everything they had Marvel uh, at that time. That's awesome. So then the, the other part of this story uh, where it kind of, he blossoms even more. So I'm just hustling for comic books at this point. I'm taking, I'm taking old, old funny book stuff that my old relatives have laying around. I'm trading it in for this Bronze Age golden goodness. Yeah. Uh, that's the, the guy. But I had no idea there was a mecca for this. I'm going to what uh, Walden Books. I'm going to uh, just little bookstores here and there. I'm going to little grocery stores here and there. Every once in a while, you find something like three or four months old on the newsstand at a, you know, at a secondhand store. But I didn't know there was any other place to go until I saw this movie called The Lost Boys in 1987. Okay, yeah. And the Frog Brothers 
ran a comic book store. I'm like, wow, either there's an actual place called a comic book store or <laughs> they have the greatest imagination ever. Yeah. And sure enough, I had never looked for a comic book store. So I looked for my first comic book store and sure enough, there was one on the far end of town. I had to take two buses to get there. <laughs> uh, you know, so I, I found my first comic book store because of the Lost Boys. And, you know, and it's kind of funny because now I just, I actually just saw Corey Feldman last weekend at uh, Fan Expo Chicago. And, yeah. uh, and, uh, and, and, and I'm like, wow, you got to really, actually, he has a pretty, he had a pretty big line. So I didn't get to go up there and tell him he's the reason why, uh, why most comic publishers um, uh, don't like me asking questions. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, and then of course, you, you know, you're an old timer. I, I'm not that old of an uh, old timer when it comes to that, but you know, Joe Ferreira, when I first met Joe Ferreira, I told him that story. And because I felt somehow compelled that Joe Ferreira started my journey into going to comic book stores. And I don't yeah. think he gets a lot of credit for being the king of comic retailing, but I don't think he gets credit for basically putting a face and a, and a, a name to what we were. Right. Yeah. So Mile High was mine. I, I was actually in Colorado in the early 80s and uh, he had shops. Uh, Mile High had shops in all the malls and uh, we had yeah. moved to a bad neighborhood and uh, I was that's where I was hanging out. 25 cent comics. They never made me uh, leave. I could read comics in there. Uh, wow. Man, it just stuck. Yeah, and like I got to meet Mike Grell there when I was uh, 13 years old, you know? Yeah. And uh, man, I love John Sable. So like I was meeting one of my uh, heroes of comics and that's when it stuck hard for me. Yeah, well, I mean, and we all have that similar road. We have, they're, they're all different, but they all lead to one place, which is we found a place called a comic store where yeah. we felt recognized as uh, a kindred spirit with people. Yeah. And Connected mean, yeah, into the know, community. Here's here's one of the bad sides that we get, but it's also rightfully so, but it's it's part of, you know, the thin skin of the current people. Dude, I felt I felt trashed on the fir by that first comic book store. The guy was <laughs> telling me I wasn't reading the right comic book. The first time I walk into his damn store, and he's telling me I'm not reading the good stuff. Oh, you're reading, you're reading Iron Man. Oh, that book sucks. You need to be reading this book or that book. And I'm like, but you were welcomed. Yeah. And, and, yeah. Right. Now they were all snobs. I think they all, I think we all are snobs for what we like. But yeah. You've got to be, you've got to have a thick enough skin to stand up for yourself to say, you know what? I really do like Iron Man, and I don't care if you hate it. You know. Well, I definitely, I definitely hand sell the stuff I like. Right. Like I, I tell people like I read a lot of. I'm, I'm really indie centric. I really think that. Well, we all know that the wheels are off at DC. Com I, I don't know where their continuity. I don't I, know. I saw the first wobble, and I've been the first one screaming and pointing at the wheel since 2011. <laughs> Well, I, I really like the new 52, actually. I mean, there's... I, oh shit, my, <laughs> I set off my Surrey on my watch for some reason. I don't know how that happened. Uh, just throw that away over there. Um, no, I, I, I liked what, okay, here's the thing. New 52, brilliant idea. Yeah. New 52, absolutely executed exactly how you had to execute it if you wanted to execute what they were doing. Right. You got to have a master composer at the podium to be able to pull it off. And Dan DiDio in no way, shape or form was that master conductor. He ain't, he ain't John Williams. I agree with you. I agree with you, but wouldn't you wish to have Dan DiDio back right now? <laughs> Well, I mean, no, 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 no. I'm sure, I'm sure somebody on one of the life rafts of the Titanic was like, you don't know how to oar. I wish we had the captain of that boat who went down over there in here. No, you wouldn't be in the life raft if it wasn't for Dan DiDio. Maybe. Yeah, that's quite possible. If, if they had simply said, Jeff Johns, 
conduct a universe. Right. You know, right. damn good and well, it would have lasted more than six fucking months. Can I say yeah. fuck on your show? Oh, yeah. Okay. It would have lasted a lot more than six fucking months with Jeff Johns conducting that orchestra. Yeah. Orchestra. yeah. yeah. That man is a genius. He was just at that uh, Chicago Expo, too. That man is a genius. His, uh, when I first opened my store in 2005, Rebirth was just coming out. Right. And I stopped reading comic books in 1997, six, whenever it was, uh, when Kevin Dooley destroyed Green Lantern, one of my favorite series. Yeah. And, and we met Kevin Dooley at a comic book convention uh, in Detroit. And I'm asking him all these questions. Well, what about Jon Stewart? At the end of Mosaic, he became one of the Guardians, but uh, Hal didn't kill John. Where's John at? Oh, he's at the Dark Stars. Okay, but does he still have the Guardians powers that he got at the end of Mosaic? I never read Mosaic. <laughs> and how the hell are you directing the entire fate of the Green Lantern universe? No, 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 you just have to accept it. It's only um, Kyle and, and, and this and Ganthet at this time. And I'm like, dude. And then I did read Ganthet's Tale, and I thought that was one of the most brilliantly written books, uh, David Niven. Yeah. And then I stopped reading because Green Lantern showed no signs of, and, and I didn't understand what Women in Refrigerators was, but I knew that was just a really trite way of just getting rid of a character. Right. And I was like, wow, what could he have done with, what could they have done with that girlfriend character? Oh, throw in a refrigerator. Now, I mean, I'm not going along with Gail Simone on what it means, misogyny and all that stuff, but it was a stupid thing to do to that character right off the bat. Right. So, you know, I was done. And then Jeff Johns comes in and every page of every word of every page of every issue of that was smartfully done reinvention using everything that was screwed up in the past right. and then coming up with the smart idea how to move forward accepting that that actually happened right keeping that's it in continuity yeah that's the man who could have made new 52 the beautiful well, that's beautiful what moved that's what moved him up the ladder the thing is is they moved him too far up the ladder and out of comics i honestly think that there were these forces and and i saw a lot of these strings at retail or something I met Diane Nelson the week that she became the CEO of DC Comics or whatever her title was. And she was at the Retailer Summit in Chicago, whatever year that was, 2009, 10, somewhere around there. And she seemed like she understood this and she definitely had faith in Jeff uh, and she definitely had faith in Jim. I, I honestly think that if she showed interest here, Somebody pulled a string over here to make that try to go over there. You know, I, I I don't know what went on in those offices, but definitely there they had all of the right people in place to make that happen around that time, and it fell apart. The sad thing is, is that, and what a lot of people hate to admit is there is very little money in publishing. No, the money no, is no, the the money is in the in intellectual property that they create through the publishing. Um, so they're never going to give up the publishing. The, just the numbers are going to zero. Like I, zero is kind of a, that's kind of clickbaity, but they are like DC has two comics in the top 50. Um, and, uh, you know, we're kind of getting off topic. We could probably have a whole episode just talking about DC, but, uh, let me get it back on course here. So in 2005, you opened up, you were probably selling new comics at that time. Well, yeah, so uh, I'll give you- And how did that happen? What, what brought you into that? So I, um, I'll give you, there's a roundabout road to 1990, I went to college, 1991, early 91, my parents gave me that uh, call saying, hey, you need to get all your crap out of the basement, we're selling the house. <laughs> I'm like, well, what am I gonna do with this? I got, you know, at that time, like 10 long boxes, I got uh, a whole bunch of boxes, all my original Star Wars toys, G.I. Joe toys. So I didn't want to sell the comic books, so I ended up uh, figuring out a way to put those around my bed so that I could just use them as part of the foundation. <laughs> and then uh, I, I went to the local uh, a kaleidoscope, a little antiques uh, bookstore and toy store. And 
I took a shoebox in there of Star Wars figures, and the guy offered me $110 for my shoebox, and I'm like, what? And that was 1990 when 110 was an actual amount of money. Money, yeah. And uh, and I'm like, what is it? Now, of course, I, I later quickly found out that uh, the Luke Skywalker and Stormtrooper, the Han and Carbonite were the two rarest figures from the Star Wars Power of the Force collection that went for about 75 bucks each then. Right. I mean, he definitely got me good, but that got me selling toys. So then I started calling all my friends when we we'd get back together for, you know, Thanksgiving or come home for, you know, summer break. And they're all like, oh, dude, dude, my mom is bitching at me to sell them all my crap in the basement so they can uh, turn it into, a, you know, a, a TV room. I'm like, right. dude, I'll buy it. And so I just started buying and flipping toy collections of all my friends. So then I was kind of really heavy into to, to, uh, toys, but I was still reading the comics on the side. I was the idiot, you know, like all of us that bought 10 copies of X-Force number one and 10 copies of X-Men number one so they could have five set or two sets and right all the different covers of this and that and the other. So I was running up my credit cards over here. I was selling toys over there. And somewhere around 1994, I started buying the rare toys that were coming out at the, the store and selling them to the comic book stores at a higher price on commission. Right. So that I could pay for my comic habit, my comic habit. Sure. And around 1996, uh, apparently a reporter called a comic store that I dealt with and was asking them about uh, hard to find toys. He had heard hard to find toys could go, you know, in the, in the stores could go for double and triple what they were. He goes, oh, you need to talk to Dennis. He's he's like the Indiana Jones of uh, of toys. And that intrigued that guy. And uh, yada, 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 a little bit later, I became uh, the, the front page poster child for toy scalping on the <laughs> Wall Street Journal. Whoa, awesome. Yeah, so, you know, I did that for, I, you know, I, I did, I had already given up Toy Scout because I was just kind of selling more collectible toys at that time. Right. Uh, and then I ended up putting on a Transformers convention, a Micronauts convention. Then I got roped into being a convention booking agent for Star Wars actors. Uh, I represented like 20 of the different actors from Star Wars for about five years. And then... Uh, we decided, my wife and I at the time, my ex-wife now, uh, decided we would settle. I was going to settle down because I wasn't going to be able to go on the road when uh, we had our first kid. Right. So I'm like, okay, what? Okay, I sell toys. I stopped reading comics, but what's the umbrella for all of this? What's the umbrella for pop culture? Right. And it's the comic book store. And I think all roads lead to the comic book store. It's a destination. So, That's what I tell people all the time. Comic book stores are a destination. Doesn't matter what kind of business model they have. People will drive and drive. And when they're on vacation, they Google them. Um, I get lots of people from very far away that come in and it, it's a destination. And it, it's really um, great for revitalizing malls and downtowns and stuff like that. Like you said, it's the Mecca. We'll get to the revitalization of the malls in a second. Oh, awesome. That was part one. Stay tuned for part two with Wonder World Comics. Okay, so as soon as one of uh, my videos on Tales from the Flip Side reaches 1,000 views, that's going to start triggering um, giveaways. And then so for every other uh, video that makes 1,000 views, there'll be another giveaway. When the first video makes 2,000 views, that'll trigger a giveaway. So the number's 1,000. We're only 300 views away from the very first video that we put here on Tales from the Flip Side. So here's what you gotta do. You gotta go back to the first uh, video and hit the share button, right? If you didn't like it, hit the like button. If you wanted to, uh, didn't put in a comment, put a comment in. Something that's gonna move us in the algorithm back up there so we can get to a thousand views so, so I can start giving away some really cool free comic books and probably some toys and some other jank stuff we'll find. We'll uh, dig in the, you know, uh, some Scott Snyder signed stuff, some Sean Lewis signed stuff, uh, some Brian O'Halloran from Clerks 3 signed stuff. 
Maybe we'll give away. I got a, I got a movie in the back. I'll get Brian to sign a movie. Listen, we're going to give away cool stuff, so stay tuned and keep watching.